In the last segment, we have discussed how security managers can allocate and justify a security budget with the help of security investment models. In this segment, we will broaden the perspective to general information security risk management, setting money aside for security controls. Even if we know how much and exactly what an organization needs, is not the only way of dealing with information security risks. You might recall the four canonical instruments in general risk management. Risk reduction or mitigation, risk acceptance, risk avoidance, and risk transfer. Each of them has a specific meaning in risk management, which equally applies to the management of cyber risk. Successful security investment corresponds to risk mitigation, the first instrument. Risk mitigation tries to reduce the likelihood and severity of loss events by protecting vulnerable assets with technical and organizational measures. But recall from the last segment that an optimal level of information security investment does not mitigate the risk completely, because at some point, the extra cost of more protection exceeds the expected losses without that protection. As a result, there remains residual risk to be managed. This leads us to risk acceptance, the second instrument. Risk acceptance means that an organization chooses to tolerate losses. This is mainly the case if no other risk management instrument is economical. Allow me three remarks on risk acceptance. First, this decision should be documented ex ante. That means before the risk materializes. Otherwise, it is hard to convince stakeholders suffering losses that risks were intentionally accepted rather than overseen or ignored. Second, keep in mind that some risks must not be accepted. For example, data protection regulation in many countries requires security controls for organizations that process personal data. Risk acceptance would break the law even if no breach occurs. Third, the propensity to accept information security risks must depend on the organization's overall risk profile. Don't confuse this risk profile with a natural person's attitude towards risks, a behavioral feature which we will discuss in a later block of this course. Here I mean the riskiness of the core business which, which sets bounds for acceptable information security risks. Here is an example. Consider two firms, an established multinational brand and a tech startup. In the language of finance, the tech startup is nothing else than an option to default. With more than 50% probability, it will not survive the next year because the technology may not work out as intended, the competitor might be faster on the market or for missing demand. In such an environment, it would be quite foolish to invest money to reduce the likelihood of a catastrophic security breach from, say, 5 to 1%. By contrast, a multinational brand looks at a much longer time horizon and has more assets to lose, including its reputation. If a catastrophic security incident might wipe out a shareholder's profits for years, a rational choice may be to spend more money, even more than proportional, on reducing the very same kind of risk that the startup rightly chose to accept. If our imaginary multinational brand can neither accept nor sufficiently reduce a specific risk, say, for lack of effective protection technology, it may take a more radical approach and avoid the risk altogether. Risk avoidance, the third canonical instrument, always implies that the organization withdraws from a risky business. For example, it could limit daily transaction amounts in the online channel or stop doing business with or in a country. The cost of risk avoidance is equal to the foregone profits from the risky business. The last instrument is risk transfer. It involves a contractual agreement with a third party to compensate the organization for losses incurred due to the realization of risk. The third party can be an insurance company who pools risks of many insurance and counts on the law, law of large numbers, which gives hope that not all risks will realize at the same time. Other constructions are possible as well, including risk-linked financial instruments traded on markets, but such institutions are still premature for cyber risk. 
even if cyber insurance is not as big a success story as many had hoped. In the early days of security economics, scholars and practitioners were enthusiastic about cyber insurance. They thought that, in particular, premium differentiation, that means charging insecure systems more than secure systems, would provide incentives to the security consumers to better secure their networks. Also, security providers would add more security to their products as it decreases their customers' total cost of ownership, which they assume would include insurance premiums. Other hopes included a larger role of the insurance industry in loss research, using their wealth of claims data, and facilitating the development of appropriate security technology and standards. However, even conservative forecasts of the cyber insurance market size have been undercut by orders of magnitude. A thin market is about to develop, after all, in niches created by market frictions, regulation, or pronounced risk aversion. So what makes cyber insurance difficult? Early answers to this question pointed to a lack of historical data to calculate competitive premiums. They complained about missing demand because senior managers were apparently not aware of their exposure to cyber risk. Also, legal uncertainties surrounding attribution and substantiation of claims were mentioned. This is all true to a certain extent, but it cannot be the whole story. Today, we look back at a decade of breach disclosure data. Digital forensics has matured as a discipline to reconstruct successions of events, and the literature, as well as the number of experts in information law, has skyrocketed. Not to mention that insurers had no issues with insuring early satellite launches where no historical data was available either. What makes cyber insurance difficult to handle at large are three distinctive features of cyber risk. Information asymmetries, externalities, and correlated risk. Ross has introduced information asymmetries at the beginning of this course. Asymmetric information impairs insurance markets if insurers cannot observe the actual security level of their insurance. This means they are unable to tell apart good risks from bad risks with the effect that risk-based premium differentiation cannot be enforced. Fixed premiums are either too high for good risks so that they do not join the pool or too low for bad risks, in which case the insurer is likely to go bankrupt. Externalities cause market failures in many parts of the cybersecurity ecosystem. Tyler is going to explain this effect at length later in this course. So let me elaborate on correlated risk, which is a specific problem for insurance and risk management at large. The whole idea of insurance is to trade an uncertain payment in the future, the potential loss, against a certain payment at present, the premium. Insurance markets exist if insurers can make such offers. They act as financial intermediaries and redistribute the premiums of insurance who did not experience a loss to the few who demand compensation for security incidents. This works if you insure a large pool of risks with occasional incidents. Let's treat this a bit more formally. Assume we have n homogeneous firms who each independently face a fixed loss lambda with probability p. And this here is the relevant distribution for an insurer who underwrites policies with all these firms. The chart shows the probability density of the total claim amount per period. We can summarize this distribution by its expected value. This gives us some guidance for the premium calculation. But hold on a second. If the insurer charges a net premium at the expected value divided by the number of insurance n, he'd be bankrupt every second period. This is so because the actual losses fluctuate around the expected value. That means they can be lower or higher. The extent of this fluctuation, in other words, the variance of the distribution, depends on the size of the pool. The more risks an insurer underwrites, the better predictable is the total claim amount. Nevertheless, even insurers with very large pools need to add a markup to the premium to reduce the probability of bankruptcy from 50% to a very small probability, for example, one in a thousand periods. This headroom is called safety capital, and the markup is used to finance it. So far, our model assumes independent sources of risk. However, cyber risk has often a common component called systemic risk in the language of finance. 
For example, a vulnerability discovered in standard software exposes all systems running the same software at the same time. To model this, we add a common factor to our risk arrival model. We introduce a new parameter, rho, to control which fraction of risk is caused by the common factor, the systemic component. The remaining risk is said to be idiosyncratic. Using some algebra, we keep the expected probability of loss p fixed as we increase the amount of correlation rho. See what happens to the shape of the total claims distribution. Larger and potentially catastrophic losses become more likely than with independent risk. This, in turn, forces the insurer to increase the safety capital by raising the markup. The premium gets more and more expensive until it exceeds the willingness to pay of the insurance. This is why correlated risk is hard to insure. Although it is difficult to quantify the amount of correlation exactly, there is quite some evidence that cyber risk is often correlated. Making cyber risk insurable therefore means to tackle the root cause of correlation. For example, by building and deploying more heterogeneous systems. In that case, newly discovered vulnerabilities do not become a common risk factor anymore. Another option is to limit interconnections to cut the propagation of risk in a network. To conclude, let me put all this in a bigger picture. Recall from Ross's segment that the properties of information goods and software in particular have unleashed unanticipated economies of scale. Those are the software industry's secret to success. They have been and will remain a major incentive to innovate in this field. The flip side of this combination of factors are monopolies for organizations and, as we have seen in this segment, monocultures of network components, which are the root causes of correlation in cyber risk. If we envision a future with more insurable information infrastructures, this would come at the cost of foregoing some of the economies of scale in exchange for more manageable cyber risk. In a globalized and interconnected world, this decision is not in the hands of any individual manager. Instead, it would require coordinated action by policymakers around the globe.